Welcome. I'm Esther Allen, and I teach at City University of New York. With me is Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Committee. She and I are co organizers of Translating the Future, and today is our super duper final finale grand marquee extravaganza event. Yes, thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for what was always meant to be the highlight of this conference. Today's event, A Flight of Tokarcha Translators, which in case you didn't know, the, the group word for Tokarcha translators is a flight, has taken <laughs> various forms. For the originally intended in-person conference, we thought we were being ambitious by inviting five of all the Tokarcha translators to New York to appear together. Mind you, we began planning this before she won the Nobel Prize in Literature last fall. Then, once we transitioned to this virtual format, it was Jennifer Croft, one of her English translators, who encouraged us to go big. And now, this morning, which is variously afternoon, evening, and night for the translators gathered here, we've assembled 10 of Olga's translators to take part in a conversation about the joys and challenges of bringing her work into their languages for readers all around the world. Translating the Future commemorates the 50th anniversary of the World of Translation, a conference that took place in New York in May of 1970 and was billed as the first international conference on literary translation held in the United States. The 1970 conference featured Isaac Besheva Singer, who had not yet been awarded the Nobel Prize at that point. We wonder who among the participants in the 2020 conference may eventually receive those laurels. We are very fortunate today to have as our moderator, Susan Harris, the editorial director of the online magazine, Words Without Borders, the essential online magazine, Words Without Borders, and the first editor to publish Olga Tokarczuk's work in English translation in the United States. She acquired House of Day, House of Night, in Antonia Lloyd-Jones's translation for Northwestern University Press way back in 2003. Susan barely blinked when we asked her to conduct a Zoom conversation among 10 people working in multiple languages and joining us from across multiple countries. The translators will introduce themselves when the program begins. We also encourage you to read each of their bios on the Center for the Humanities website. We are grateful to have several sponsors for this conversation and would like to offer sincere thanks to the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication, Boston University Center for the Humanities and its newly launched MFA in Literary Translation, the East Central European Center at Columbia University and the Polish Cultural Institute New York for their generous support of today's program. We will soon hear welcoming remarks from the director of PCI NY, Robert Zaniawski. As always, today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for any or all of the Tokarczuk translators and for Susan to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future is convened by Pen America's Translation Committee which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn Miller Lachman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. For those unable to join us for today's live stream or any of the other conference programs, recordings are and will remain posted on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites, as well as on Penn's archive. Before we turn things over to Robert, we'd like to offer our undying gratitude for this final time to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America. And to our dear friends at HowlRound, in particular, the inestimably wonderful Travis Amiel, 
whose superb work for the past four months has made these live streams possible. And now over to Robert Shaznowski of the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Alison, for your warm welcome. Um, I'd like to, to very warm thank to the organizers of the today's event, Pan America Translating Committee, as well as our partners, which names were already mentioned. Uh, so, um, well, I, I would like to, 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 to say that it, it is really, really great to be here among people who really love literature. And um, uh, from my personal record, I must tell you that many years ago, I tried to be as close to literature as possible. So when I was a student, I, I decided to, to be a literature critic. And one of the first books that I tried to write something about was Olga Tokarczuk's first novel, which was called uh, The Journey of the People of, of the Book. I think that it is worth reminding this, this her first novel because there were some, some motives which tend to be repetitive. They, uh, they tend to, to recurrent in her following works, no matter which gender she chose as a, as a tool for her writings. So one of the motives, of the motives uh, is traveling, uh, another one is, is literature itself, um, the book. Uh, so uh, it is a kind of uh, a mirror uh, that, uh, that gathers not only personal ex human experience, but a kind of collective memory, a kind of collective human experience. Probably it has something to do with the philosophy of uh, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, in this in this vision of, of of literature as something really really important which gives a kind of very very deep insight into um, into human uh, or humanity uh, soul uh, the role of, of translators is is obviously very much important important they, they are a kind of carriers of books, uh, carriers of literature from one language to, to another. So I think that in case of this particular author, Olga Tokarczuk, uh, your, your role is very much appreciated. I hope that, that your today's discussion will be very fruitful and I'm looking forward to, to, to listen to, to it. And now I, I, I'm giving the virtual floor to um, Susan Harris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Allison and Esther, for arranging this wonderful event um, with our, our flight of, of Polish translators, of Tokarczyk translators. As Allison said, that is the uh, collective noun for them. Um, Olga Tokarczyk's work is read all over the world, of course, but according to statistics compiled by the Polish Literary Translators Association, a total of 193 translations exist by as many as 90 translators into 37 languages. The first Tokarczyk book to be translated was EE, e., translated into English in 1996. And the most recent is Playing Many Drums, published last year in Albanian. To open our conversation, Wonderfully, we have a message from Olga Tokarczuk herself to the participants, translated into English by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. My dear friends, I'm very happy to know that I am the inspiration for your event. The mere fact that I can connect people from a wide range of countries of different ages and with various likes and interests is a source of great joy for me, a real compliment. Literature really does have the power to unite. We're the living proof of it. I hope you'll have a wonderful time. I'll be with you in spirit. Love and best wishes from my travels, Olga. 
Now each of our translators will introduce himself or herself, the language from which he or she translate into which he or she translates, and will say a bit about what brought each of them to Polish and how they started translating Olga Tokarczuk's work. First up is another Olga, Olga Baginczka Shinzato, who translates into Portuguese. Hello, um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon as well. <laughs> um, my name is Olga Baginska Shinzato and uh, I translate to Brazilian Portuguese. Um, I'm also a Brazilianist, I'm a translator. Um, I uh, teach at the University of Warsaw. Uh, I teach Brazilian liter literature. Um, and uh, my adventure with uh, Olga Tokarczuk's work um, started a few years ago. Actually, it started with some I would say his fascination with her work um, and the sort of affinity <laughs> um, on the outlook of, of the world, of, of life, of crossing borders. Um, and um, that fascination led me to the books of Jacob. And I think that everything started with the books of Jacob. I just, um, just as Olga said that when she was writing the book, uh, it seemed that the whole world was helping her write the book that the world needed. <laughs> The books of uh, Jacob to to be to be written, and um, at some point I had a feeling that Brazil also um, I don't know if needed or it, it just um, needed to get to know Olga and um, needed to get to know Olga's work. So um, I did a sample translation of uh, the books of Jacob, and I think that's how everything started. Um, as to the Polish language, well, um, I'm Polish, so. <laughs> Uh, Brazilian Portuguese is my, I would say, the language of my heart and my soul <laughs> and uh, the language that I uh, best um, can communicate in. And um, I think that's, 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 that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Olga. Next up will be Jennifer Croft, who translates into English, one of, one of Olga Tokarczuk's two translators into English. Thank you, Susan. And before I say anything about me, I just want to say how much I have appreciated this really magnificent summer of fascinating programs on translation that Alison, Mark and Paul and Esther Allen have organized so brilliantly and so industrially, industriously, sorry. Um, and it's just, it's been such a dispiriting time and, and this is, this has been an unprecedented opportunity for collaboration and fascinating um, discussion every every week. So I can't really say how much I've appreciated it, but I know a lot of people feel similarly. Um, and I came to Polish in 2001. Um, I don't have, I grew up only speaking English, but I was very interested in Russian literature. And when I began graduate school at the University of Iowa, I had the opportunity to study Polish as well. And I knew that I wanted to translate contemporary women's writing. And I came across Olga's short story collection, which was published in 2001, Playing Many Drums, in the university library. And I kind of fell in love with her style um, and her ambitious yet very accessible um, grouping of thematic interests. So I, um, I found that Antonia Lloyd-Jones had already translated some work by Olga and I immediately wrote to her to, to kind of ask where she was with her translations and if there might be any room for me to translate a story. Um, and she was so incredibly generous and ended up introducing me to Olga and to many other people who have been so helpful in my career. And I published my first short story in 2005. Thank you, Jenny. Uh Next up, Barbara Delfino, who translates into Italian. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Delfino, and uh, I'm one of the <clears throat> three um, Olga's Italian translator. Uh, I knew Olga's novels uh, when I was uh, at the uh, university. I was studying uh, Russian and Polish exactly in this order. It means Russian by choice uh, and Polish by chance. And uh, at the end uh, of my studies, uh, I wrote a dissertation uh, on uh, the dream dimension uh, in the first four Olga's novels. 
And uh, in my dream dimension, uh, there was uh, the intention of becoming uh, Olga's translator. And in fact, I did it. And um, the first book uh, um, of Olga that I translated uh, has been uh, Flights, uh, that has the Italian title, I Vagabondi. And now in this moment, I'm translating the, the books of Jacobs so that uh, will be published, uh, I think, next, next, next year or in summer or in autumn, we're not sure. Um, the experience of uh, translating Olga's books uh, and uh, all what turns around this translation, this experience is, uh, is very amazing. It's really amazing for me because uh, in my, I've never had such an experience uh, in my 20 years of uh, this kind of, of work uh, in this in this field, and I'm very happy of this. And it's all. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, next, Christina Godon, who translates from Romanian. Hello, Susan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Godon. Um, I'm uh, Olga's translator um, into Romanian, and um, my journey with uh, Olga Tokarczuk's uh, work began uh, in uh, 2010 with uh, the translating of uh, Flight, and um, has continued ever since with uh, four other novels, House of Day, House of Night, Last Tales, um, Drive uh, Your Plow Through the uh, Bones of the Dead, and uh, Tales of the Bizarre. And I'm currently working on uh, the books of Jacob. Um, however, um, it's uh, worth mentioning that um, uh, the journey of the Book of People and uh, Primeval and Other Stories are uh, Olga Tokarczuk's first two books to be translated into Romanian by uh, two different uh, translators. Um, so long before flights in 2001, 2002. Um, in my case, um, the publishing uh, houses approached me, uh, so I didn't have to, uh, to search for a publisher. Um, and uh, I guess that's because uh, at that time, uh, Olga Tokarczuk's uh, work was already um, known in Romania. Um, but uh, there is a nine year gap between flights and the previous translation, so that's also significant. That's interesting. Thank you, Christina. Now, Antonia Lloyd-Jones, uh, Olga Tokarczuk's first translator into English. Hello, everyone from rather gloomy today, Warsaw. Um, I started off as, as a Russianist. I studied Russian. And in 1983, I found myself in Poland at the tail end of martial law. And it was really rather embarrassing to be speaking in Russian. So I sort of accidentally fell into learning Polish out of a need for political correctness in a sensitive situation and sat in a field with my friends who were agriculture students who were chasing cows around the field while I read <laughs> Polish and um, gathered mushrooms in my skirt because there was nothing to eat at the time. Uh, so um, I somehow, something in me just clicked and I switched to Polish. I'd just graduated and I just put all my energy into trying to learn this language and didn't have much chance to study it. I kind of had to teach myself. And then everything in my life happens by accident. And uh, I met Olga by accident because her agent in those days was a Dutch publisher called Adrian van Rijsseweyck. And he and his wife were good friends of Olga and her husband, and they had decided to buy a house in the same area where Olga lived. And uh, he invited me to come and stay, but he didn't explain that the house was actually uninhabitable and with a tree growing in the sitting room. So I arrived and he picked me up and explained on the way from Wrocław Airport out into the countryside that I couldn't actually stay at his house. So he was taking me to this writer's house. And the airline had managed to lose my luggage. So the first thing that happened to me was I met Olga on the threshold of her house in Krajanov in the countryside. And she gave me a toothbrush, a pair of pajamas, and a packet of paper disposable panties. 
And it's still a mystery to this day where they came from or how she came to have them or what on earth they were about. Um, but that was my introduction to that house. And I had absolutely no idea at that point that I was ever going to be her translator. But not that long after, the same agent managed to sell the rights for House of Day, House of Night to grant her publishing in London. And he recommended me and I came to translate that book about the house where I had been so warmly received. And um, that house became a part of my life and it still is because I went back summer after summer and rode Olga's horse around the neighborhood having strange adventures, um, which is another whole story about being chased by a stallion. I'll tell you another time, not recommended. And um, it was really wonderful to know the house and know the place when I came to translate House of Day, House of Night, because there's so much of it infused in that book. And now Olga has um, done a great deal of work at the house and has organizes a big literary festival there. And I think we're all going to have somewhere to stay to go and work quietly, thanks to Olga's generosity. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Perhaps we'll get to the stallion story later in the, in the conversation. <laughs> Um, and next up, Hikaru Ogura, who translates into Japanese. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hikaru Ogura. Uh, I will briefly tell you about my first encounter with Olga's works, uh, very briefly. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I had a chance to teach Japanese at University of Warsaw as a visiting lecturer uh, for one year. And I had, um, after classes, I, had, I spent lots of time uh, storing the city. And I visit uh, very often uh, the bookshops. And at one point, I saw uh, many, uh, many copies of titles, uh, titles um, uh, of the same title laid out in uh, promotional displays in, in every shop. Uh, it was uh, playing on many drums by Olga Tokarczuk. I didn't know her, but... Uh, I read it about 20 years ago and instinctively I knew that uh, this also would be loved by Japanese readers and that I would love to translate her works myself. Yeah. And uh, after a while, after returning to Japan, uh, I sent several pages from uh, House of the House Night in my translation to a publishing house uh, that was going to launch a new literature series. And the uh, publishing house uh, uh, liked my translation and agreed to publish the book. Uh, yeah, uh, so that is uh, House of the House Night in my translation. Yes, uh, this is the first translation of mine. And the second uh, was... Uh, flight in 2014. But uh, before the flights, I get a grant from my university and uh, I could invite Olga to Japan. And I and my uh, colleagues organized a lecture series in Japan. It was in uh, 2013. It was really fun. And we hope, uh, we hope she will come back to Japan very much. And third was, uh, third was, uh, the Prima uh, and other times in Japanese. Uh, this was published in uh, this was published last year, just after Nobel Prize last year. So it was very good promotion for this book. <laughs> yes, and yes, and the uh, fourth is coming coming soon in this November. Uh, but uh, this is Polish, but uh, the lost soul in Japanese is coming soon. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Hikaru. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Hikaru. Uh, now up, we have Lisa Palmas and Lothar Kinkenstein, who translate into German together. Hello, everyone. Um, a little bit, ah, okay, the other yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, it's better when we talk together because we have mainly the same topics. My name is Lisa Palmas. I am translating from Polish into German since uh, 12 years already and uh, I started to learn and study Polish because I had some Polish friends and started to be interested in the language and so I uh, changed my profession and uh, thought I could study something interesting. Um, with Olga Tokarczuk, um, of course I knew 
um, her translations very soon, uh, but I never thought about translating uh, her myself because uh, she was uh, Poland was the guest country on the Frankfurt Book Fair in the year 2000, and after that, a lot of translations uh, also from Olga Tokarczuk uh, were published, and the translator was always Esther Kinski, and uh, she now is writing herself. So, so when uh, the books of Jacob uh, were looking for a translator, she didn't want to do the work and uh, asked me if I would be interested. So I started to see if I can find um, a publisher in German. And this is the part where Lothar uh, and I were connecting together because um, after a really long time, I was trying to find a publisher and uh, the people were hesitating because the book is very big, more than a thousand pages. So I, uh, I thought about giving up. And then at this moment, Lothar asked me if I would mind if he also uh, tries to find a, um, a publishing house. And then uh, we try to do it together. And I think all in all, after three years, we found a publisher. And now I give the voice to Lothar, and then he can tell the successful part of the story. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Lothar Quinkenstein. Um, I translate also from Polish into uh, German. And I'm working as university teacher in Słubice, Poland, at an institution which is called Collegium Polonicum. So uh, when I'm sitting there uh, at the office, I'm looking out of the window right at the German-Polish border, which is a river there, uh, the river Oda, Odra, uh, an image of uh, steadiness and change uh, at the same time, I would say. And I feel myself very comfortable on both banks of this river, uh, of this image of, uh, of the border and this image of time, actually. Um, I'm also, uh, between teaching and translation, I'm a writer myself, uh, dealing mostly with uh, some topics connected also to, to Poland. And uh, yes, actually, the story uh, of the books, with the books of Jacob, uh, was really interesting. Uh, and I don't want to use uh, the the word um, chance or accident because I think there was something, there was some hand uh, directing behind it. Uh, what hand? I don't know, but something was there behind. Uh, we had translated already one book together, Lisa and me. Uh, this was uh, Ludwig Hirschfeld, his autobiography. Uh, and this work was so inspiring as a tandem that we wanted to continue it. And we were looking for something long, Let's say <laughs> so. It would, it would be, uh, it would be um, uh, very suitable to, to uh, work uh, together on it. So we choose the books of Jacob, and um, there was this specific situation that Olga Tokarczuk uh, for several years was not uh, actually present uh, in Germany uh, in the German language um, because there was at a certain point a stop. Uh, of the publications, uh, and then we actually could bring her back with the books of Jacob. Um, and this was the moment then, uh, one week, I think, after the publication of the books of Jacob in Germany, uh, she got the Nobel Prize. So this was all directed very well, <laughs> very precise. And since then, uh, we, uh, um, we, we continue uh, this work. And uh, recently, uh, I translated uh, the Lost Soul and the Tales of the Bizarre. And now, um, in the, at the moment, we are working on the next collection of stories uh, together as a tandem once. Wonderful. Thank you, Lothar and Lisa. Now we will hear from Pavel Petsch, who translates into Czech. Pavel? I'm here. Hello. Ah, there's Pavel. Hi, world. Uh, my name is Pavel Petsch. I come from the Czech Republic. Uh, I'm really grateful to take part in this uh, wonderful gathering, although I have to say I'm a little bit a stand-in <clears throat> for the other translators uh, of Olga's into Czech, uh, because there are about five or six of us, I counted so far. And of course, we have our wonderful colleague that my uh, uh, my friends here know very well. It's Petr Vidlak, who says hello to you. 
and uh, who has been translating the books of Olga's uh, over the last 20 plus years. Okay, so what was my adventure with Olga's books? Uh, actually, it is closely connected to Petr, uh, who uh, sort of gave me a call one day that he's not uh, doing well with finishing and meeting the deadline of translating flights into Czech. So we sort of cooperated, co-translated the book in, in Czech, into Czech together. And uh, from that time on, I think it was the middle part of my interest in Olga because I had met her at various uh, sort of readings and uh, stuff before, uh, and I was interested in her, and it's very interesting, and I want to talk about the relation of Volgas to the Czech Republic, of course. Antonia has, no, uh, has, uh, has mentioned the house, right? So the house is very close to the Czech border, and I think Olga would say that she has a lot of friends, a lot of relations, and also Czech readers, are sort of very aware of the fact, correct me if I'm wrong, Antonia, uh, that, uh, you know, she's a little bit of a, of our writer <laughs> in literature. So she's not considered, of course, the interest in her is very, very strong among the Czech readership. And uh, every book uh, gets translated, gets immediate attention and so on. And she sort of uh, counted into our home. And because Czechs miss uh, Nobel Prize winners in literature, we only have one, uh, sadly. Uh, it was a very good news uh, in the Czech Republic that, that she got the prize and uh, she was awarded. But I think she's still uh, looked upon as a part of our, of our world. So this was actually, I got to her work very naturally uh, through that as a reader fascinated once again with uh, um, the magical sort of uh, uh, world in her books. And I would say I would never go to translate her work if it wasn't a short deadline. <laughs> <laughs> but I was very happy to take this, take up this job uh, because I would otherwise be very shy. And I'm really glad I did because now here we are. Uh, in a wonderful circle of sort of fellow uh, translators from all around the world and uh, we can talk about Olga's work and and it's wonderful. Also I would like to say hello to Lothar who mentioned the other Odra river. Uh, actually I'm sitting uh, 200 meters from the Olza river <laughs> which is sometimes mistaken but it is on the Czech-Polish border and also I am in the divided town of Cheshin or Teshin. So I can see a little bit of a similarity with Svubice, which I visited. I visited your university last year and uh, close parallels to, to that. And I think also Olga's world is sometimes placed on the borders like this. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Pavel. For Pavel, having me. Pavel, that's fascinating about the, the borders. Um, now we'll go to Ostap Slavinsky, who translates into Ukrainian. Hello. Hello from the other country neighboring with Poland, from the other side. Uh, my story <laughs> of the first meeting with Olga was, was something I would call fantastic. Uh, when, I, when I studied uh, Slavic philology uh, in the at the university, uh, Olga's books were something like the must-reads in Ukraine. She was really popular at that time. Uh, her um, journey of the people of the book and the primeval and the other times were translated into Ukrainian by the very experienced uh, translators. Uh, so I would never assume that I, one day I would join this brilliant company. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, we, the young students, philologists at uh, the university, were ambitious enough that in the year 2004, we started a very tiny literary festival in my city in Viv. 
but we we dared to invite Olga Tokarczuk uh, to be one of the participants without any special hopes that she would come. Um, all of a sudden, after two days, uh, uh, she answered to our mail and she said, yes, I would come. And uh, in two days, she was, uh, she was in Lviv. She came very late in the evening uh, with the last bus, uh, tourist bus. Uh, she crossed uh, uh, that very problematic Ukrainian-Polish border, very problematic at that, at that time. Uh, and I remember the long hours when the, we were uh, walking around the night city looking for some place where we could eat something. We found it finally. But this was uh, my first meeting with Olga and the first moment when I felt some very deep personal connection with Olga. And the next time we, we met, uh, it was in uh, 2009, when I was translating the flights Biguni into Ukrainian, and uh, it, coinc it coincided uh, in a very interesting way uh, b um, with her work uh, on the books of Jacob. She started the works, uh, the, her work on the books of Jacob, and she carried out uh, her writer's research in Ukraine because the, uh, a big part of action and the books of Jacob. Uh, um, it takes place in Ukraine. She came with her husband, and it was our next ta na next meeting. And we uh, continued our long walks around the Ukrainian cities, uh, sm bigger and smaller, looking for a very very special things like uh, very ancient Jewish cemeteries, for example, or or some other uh, very secret places. Um, but it's it's another story. Probably we'll have uh, some time to uh, to talk about it as well. Thank you. Oh, Ostap, you have left us all in suspense. We we may have to, we may have to hear more about that later. Um, thank you, translators, all of you, for telling your various stories. So so fascinating to hear how each of you came to Polish and how each of you came to Olga's work. Um, now we'll move into a general discussion. Um, our first conversation. You, you all translate into such different languages. Um, we wonder what are the challenges you faced with bringing Olga's writing into your language? Um, Christina, would you like to go first? Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that um, from my experience, um, I cannot say I have uh, encountered particularly challenging situations or cases of, let's say, um, uh, linguistic or cultural uh, untranslatabilities. Um, because I simply relish translating Olga's uh, work and I simply dive into the text, it's like channeling her work. But um, I can um, dissociate a bit and um, um, mm, I can say that uh, Part of the difficulties that might arise in translating her um, uh, novels um, might uh, be generated by uh, her narrative being multi-threaded and uh, uh, multi-layered with uh, plenty of references to myths, legends, uh, astronomy, astrology, uh, religion, the arcana, you name it. Um, and that requires from the translator to uh, skillfully navigate such uh, areas of expertise um, he's not necessarily um, familiar with. Another tricky aspect, um, I think, uh, uh, resides in uh, Olga's language. I mean, at first glance, it's very accessible. However, it's, it's also very rich in meaning. Um, her narrative um, is seemingly uncomplicated, yet the language is very uh, vivid, um, poignant, natural, uh, succulent, humorous. And that again requires from the translator the same uh, richness, lightness, uh, easiness uh, of expression into his own language. Um, another thing I, uh, that I've uh, uh, noticed is that um, her uh, narrative is not Build um, 
entirely on words or by words, uh, but also uh, by images. And uh, again, that requires from the translator um, to recreate and to render this imagery into his own language and requires in-depth knowledge of uh, uh, one's own language. Um, the fact that Olga Tokarczuk switches uh, swiftly from uh, uh, one register to another at the lexical uh, level and um, uh, navigates gracefully or crosses gracefully a literary genres also uh, can be trying for, uh, for the translator. And um, uh, it requires, in my opinion, a bit of a wide cultural horizon um, as well. So um, yes, what can I say? Um, also the, the um, um, storytelling, it doesn't follow a, a linear traditional uh, timeline. It's like, it, it mirrors, in my opinion, the, the human consciousness or the stream of, con of consciousness. It's not linear, it's sometimes uh, um, mingled, uh, scattered. It's, um, and I think Olga Tokarczuk catches its characteristic of, of, uh, of human consciousness very, uh, very well in her works and it's not very easy to, to translate. Um, apart from that, I think, <laughs> It's very easy and very pleasant to work upon her text, really. Thank you, Christina. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. It's interesting that you chose the word navigate and talking about the horizons because so much of Olga's work, as has been mentioned, is predicated on the notion of travel and movement. And yes. And Barbara, you also translated Flights, um, which is one of one of Christina's books. Uh, what kind of what kind of challenges did you find, Barbara, um, in, in your work on Olga's books? OK, this is a, a matter about which we very often discuss with uh, other colleagues that translate from other languages, because um, mm, Polish and in particular Olga's uh, novels uh, I made up very often of very short sentences. Very short, but very mm, striking. And um, reading few words of our novels, uh, you can feel um, deep emotion or um, someone, uh, someone also a sense of consternation or pleasure, or few pleasure. And this is a very big problem for us, for Italian translators, because we usually, uh, use very long sentences uh, with a lot of uh, commas, a lot of uh, subordinate sentences. So rendering in, uh, in Italian this uh, um, giving uh, to the Italian reader the same effect that uh, Olga Tocaccius gives to her readers uh, is very complicated sometimes. Um, I remember when I delivered my first uh, um, book uh, translated from Polish, not uh, from all, not of Olga, but of another um, Polish author. I delivered it to the um, publisher and uh, he read it and he said, okay, now please uh, transform it uh, with an Italian style because uh, <laughs> it's different. And uh, I tried uh, and um, uh, I guess he said, he said that um, uh, the Polish style is uh, too telegraphic for the Italian reader. And so I have to manage it, but only for the first pages, and then I continue to follow the, the Polish author style. And uh, so this is the, the, the principal challenge that I have to manage uh, always uh, when uh, I translate uh, uh, novels from Olga Tokarczyk. Thanks, Barbara. Lisa and Lothar, uh, translating into German, do you find similar challenges as to what Barbara found in Italian? Lisa and Lothar? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, um, I think maybe we, I can only talk uh, about uh, the books of Jacob because that was the work we did together, except uh, for it I had uh, also the Nobel lecture, but I think it's, uh, there's nothing so special to talk about. But the books of Jacob had uh, the language difficulties were of the, not of the same uh, nature as Barbara mentioned, uh, that they were within the language, but um, we had different uh, language layers because the whole story is in the 17th century. 
So we had letters and all, uh, already uh, also some um, original texts uh, even quoted. So then we had to find a similar old language in German. Then um, we had the normal uh, talking voice that was in a modern uh, language. Uh, I think that voice was uh, mostly Olga's voice. And then we had um, a person, a figure in the book who is writing a kind of diary. And that was, again, another language level. So we had to balance or to find languages for, for three, at least three different levels. And... Um, and switch between them and also uh, try to find equivalents for some 17th century language that we are not, um, of course, not using anymore. And these were basically the language difficulties we, we had with the books of Jacob. Yeah, we, we also, we also um, had long discussions um, about certain kind of... Uh, let's say, a certain kind of um, uh, locating, uh, locating the story in a cultural way, in a certain region. Uh, and um, we wanted to give it um, a little touch, our translation, um, a little touch of uh, Austro-Hungarian language because of the connection with Galicia. So Galicia, uh, this old landscape, historical landscape, should be present also in the language. And we found out that there, by, by reading uh, authors from Galicia, uh, German language authors uh, from the 20th century mostly, uh, in their autobiograph autobiographical memories, we were looking for specific vocabulary, which was really specific uh, German vocabulary, but used only in this region. So uh, when the story of Jacob uh, is moving around, uh, let's say, in the region of Lviv, Lemberg, uh, and some other places connected to Galicia, we use these terms. And when it's moving into other parts of Europe, we uh, switch to, uh, let's, so, let's say, a standard, standard German. And this was a very interesting, uh, interesting aspect. Uh, we learned a lot uh, by, by reading these authors. Uh, and I uh, think this is uh, something um, that, that brings more color into this translation, that you can really hear something like, a, uh, yes, let's say something like a, like a voice which is connected to this place. And one interesting story, uh, it was just the first reading, the first meeting, just on the day when Olga received the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, we were at the German town, the German town called Bielefeld. And there was an actress reading on that evening. And after the reading, she came to me and she said, uh, I must you ask a question because I am uh, from Munich and I'm very astonished to find so many Austrian vocabulary in some parts of the book. You too, uh, you and your colleague, you are probably from Austria. And I said, no, we are, we are not from Austria, but it's very nice that you mentioned that because this was uh, a concept that we followed by doing the translate. Wonderful. Um, Hikaru, you translate Olga Tokarczuk's work into Japanese. We've been talking about, yes. we've been talking about the very European content of her books mm -hmm. and how the various, yeah. tra the translators into the various European languages have handled mm -hmm. that. Uh, what challenges have you faced translating Olga's work into Japanese with that very different, uh, those very different cultural and geographical constraints? Yes, yes, actually Japanese and European languages are very different in every aspect. And so it takes many uh, different techniques to translate Polish, uh, literature from Polish. And, but uh, what, uh, uh, without concerning geogra geographical or linguistic difference, uh, what I pay the utmost attention to is uh, not to break, not to break the poetic aspect or sensitive aspect of August works. And the Japanese language has uh, many more uh, personal pronouns, uh, pre uh, many more personal pronouns uh, than European languages. And its use of honorifics, uh, honorifics uh, uh, is much complicated, much complicated. So uh, I believe taking advantages 
taking advantage of these uh, things helped me uh, to produce a uh, more sensitive uh, translate, a more sensitive translation, uh, uh, I think. Um, yeah, for example, depending on uh, format, uh, we can uh, use um, uh, we can use many ways, uh, many ways to say I or you or she or she or he or something like that. And I also pay attention. Uh, I also pay attention to the way my translation uh, sounds, uh, sound so that if uh, uh, it would give comfort to the readers um, uh, if it were uh, to be read aloud. Uh, yeah. Um, Sound, sound is very uh, poetic. Sound kind of uh, is very important uh, aspect, I think, uh, for August writing. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, Japan. Uh, I try to. Uh, 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 I try to keep this aspect in also in, in Japanese translation. I uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Hikaru. Um, one of the one of the points made about Olga's work, and I think several of you have touched on it, is that her books, although they do share certain motifs and they share certain themes, are wildly different. And each book, uh, there there is no there is no sense. I think when you read Olga's books, that you are necessarily reading the same author time after time. Um, I know I, I certainly. Um, reading, reading flights, and then following that with "Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead" was a, quite wh a whiplashing effect. Um, but those of you who have translated more than one of Olga's works, um, I wonder what changes you've noticed in her style over time. And Antonia, I'm particularly interested in your take since you did "House of Day, House of Night" back in the early 2000s, and then just published "Drive Your Plow" last year. So what, what kind of changes, Antonia, do you see um, in, in, in Olga's style over time? In some ways, she's like Athena. She emerged from Zeus's head fully armed and kind of ready for battle. In many ways, she, she just is a, a, a brilliant writer who was born to do what she does. But of course, we've all observed developments in her work over the years. And um, I think there's been a great growth in confidence, pretty rapidly, in fact. And she kind of found her feet as a writer quite fast. But she's always had this sort of healthy anarchy of wanting to play around with form. She can't bear to write a just straightforward, boring, linear novel. She's always making the form work for her. So what I've seen her do is develop these different attitudes to convention, sort of grab it by the throat and give it a good shaking. So um, the genres have to fit her requirements, not the other way around. And um, there was the, the, the Greek soldier poet Archilochus wrote a lovely thing about the fox and the hedgehog. And the hedgehog has one trick, it rolls into a ball and it's safe. And the head, but the fox has many tricks. And Isaiah Berlin used this as a metaphor for writing about writers. And he wrote a wonderful essay where he talks about some writers as foxes and others as hedgehogs. And Olga is most categorically a fox. So she has this versatility and um, she can keep reinventing herself and keep finding a new way to, to do things. And, I'm, I'm really not surprised when she has more than one translator in different languages, because sometimes I can't relate to one book, but I can re relate to another. So when I think about the three novels that I've translated, there's House of Day, House of Night, which is a, what Olga calls a constellation novel, like Flights. Consist, it's the one, it's the kind of counterpart to Flights in, in that it's the one about the opposite of traveling. It's about never going anywhere and staying in one place. But it's built up of this patchwork of pieces, including diary pieces and stories, which all form a sort of whole. And there is a wholeness to it, particularly when you translate it, you feel that thread going through it and a sort of thread of a slightly sinister mood to it. 
And then I translated uh, Primeval and Other Times. And something I'm very lucky I share with Olga is that we both absolutely love fairy tales and have always, all our lives, she's, she's always collected and read a great deal of, of myths and legends from around the world. She loves them. And that shows in Primeval and Other Times where she's taking that genre of myth and just turning it into her own take to give a kind of microcosm portrait of central Europe through the 20th century. Amazing to just filter all that down into this story of this family that's told in a mythical way. And then I translated Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead, where I think most of the translators who've done it will agree what's crucial is the central voice, the narrator's voice, this rather eccentric, crazy, unique voice, this person who could be frightfully off-putting. You could read several pages of her and want to head for the hills, but you've got to make her sympathetic to the reader. And Olga does that. She kind of makes the reader her, uh, the main character's accomplice and drags the reader into being involved in some very shady business indeed. But that's challenging for the translator because you have to recreate that voice in the same way so that you also keep the reader with you for 250 pages, although the person whose hand they're trustingly holding and going into the forest with is completely bonkers. <laughs> Olga, you also translated drive your plow. Um, what kind of changes have you also seen um, in Olga Tokarczuk's style um, across different books? Um, well, just as Antonia said, um, the, the differences are very visible. Uh, I mean, if you read, for example, um, EE, and then you read um, Flights or Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, and then the books of Jacob, you will like, it, just by in, intuitionally, you will you will you will feel that the style is different. And um, in case of um, uh, drag the uh, drive your plow over the bones of the dead, it's it's a very I would say um, um, it, it's it's a different book. Just as Antonia said, you know the, the most important thing is is the voice. So you have to recreate the voice. And uh, for example, in Brazilian Portuguese, that was. I wouldn't say it was it was difficult, but um, uh, there was because Brazilian Portuguese is I would say it's less formal than Polish. The Polish voice, Janina Dusheko's voice, is quite formal. I mean, she's eccentric. She's um, she's very emotional, but at the same time, she's quite of uh, formal, uh, especially when she writes the the letters. Uh, so in Brazilian Portuguese, that that was. Um, it wasn't hard, but I'd have to like put myself, you know, into her uh, head and voice, and you know, try to recreate the uh, woman, you know, in her sixties, for example, uh, in her sixties, just you know, talking to you or to the to the readers, you know, and 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 telling her strange stories. So um, and also the the astrology, for example. Um, the, the parts where you have, uh, you know, her, um, her lectures on astrology, that, that, was, that was quite um, complicated or <laughs> difficult as, as well, just to not, not to get, you know, the, the reader board with that, yeah. Of course. Um, Ostap, you also did, you did um, books of Jacob and you also did flights. Uh, what kind of change, what kind of, uh, D differences and changes did you notice again over over time as you translated uh, into Ukrainian? Uh, well, I um, uh, I have an impression that uh, um, the books of Jacob, uh, the the book uh, which was really very very expected by um, by many people by many uh, Olga's readers. Um, uh, they are in some sense and to some extent a uh, continuation of uh, this um, traveling story. But uh, if um, mm, uh, um, uh, in, in the flights you have uh, um, mostly the heroes who escape from something, they escape, they are, they want to escape from their lives, first of all. And um, uh, if I try to state it in one word, 
uh, I would say that flight is a story, is a novel of escape, uh, of um, some, some trust, some journey, which has only a starting point, but it doesn't have a finish point. It doesn't have its, uh, um, uh, its visible uh, point. Uh, while it, uh, Books of Jacob is a novel, uh, which uh, could be um, as described as a story of search for home, metaphysical home, not a geographical, spatial, but a home for one's soul. So uh, it's very interesting how these two texts are uh, similar, complementary, and different, deeply different on some very, very profound level. And, but uh, both these texts uh, really uh, give a very important message to, to all of us, the, um, the contemporary people, people of 21st century, because it's, uh, uh, these texts are the texts about the other, the otherness, uh, the someone who um, has no uh, natural place to be, uh, no, no natural home, no spatial home, and sometimes is uh, in a situation when he or she uh, has to look for its uh, for 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 the for the home somewhere in, in some spiritual spheres, not spatial, and we have to be ready to see and to hear these people sometimes besides us very closely to us and it's very important also to the ukrainian readers i think uh, it's a very it was a very very important message uh, an important story about our country our our lands absolutely um oh step i'm i'm it's so interesting that you focused on the topic of otherness that of course is what one characteristic of works in translation that the publisher and the translator, of course, always work to not overcome and not even necessarily a lead, but ease to bring a book from one language, one culture into another. And translators are so crucial um, in the reception of writers in other countries, in other languages, obviously, that was a very obvious comment. Um, I'm interested in the reception of Olga Tokarczuk's works in each of your country. Um, Pavel, what is the reception of Olga Tokarczuk's work in the Czech Republic? Pavel? Okay, here I am. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I mentioned it in the introduction. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's almost as she was uh, one of our own female writers. And although we have a wave of, a wave, I would call it, uh, we have many wonderful female writers at the moment in the Czech literature, which is a very fascinating sort of uh, way of uh, uh, sort of treating with the, with the old male <laughs> waves that came. <clears throat> She's considered a part of it, actually, yeah. And as I was saying, the only uh, each of Olga's books that came into the Czech Republic uh, were very much expected. And I don't envy Petr Vidlak because they had to be translated very quickly <laughs> uh, because the readers were expecting it. And also we had some sort of uh, other editions uh, as well uh, that, that came with it, re reprints. Uh, also, uh, you know, many personal ties that are inserted with Olga. So I think the Czech Republic uh, is really um, another home to Olga. I don't know if she would agree with the fact, but, uh, you know, she's very much based here from the beginning, from her very first books and through the readership uh, sort of reactions uh, to her books. And she's, she's a part of our culture. I wrote, <laughs> I wrote an article after she received, uh, and she and Jenny, who's with us, received the Manu International Booker Prize two years ago. 
I <clears throat> I was asked to write an article about Olga and this prize uh, into uh, one of the Czech literary magazines, and I put the title, and they kept it, and it was our uh, in English. I guess you you would loosely translate it as Our Lady of the Noble Prize. Yes, ah. so she she was she was actually our lady and everyone was very curious I, 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 and i'm sure the other translators into check got phone calls and and stuff and congratulations everybody was so so much happy because you know in uh, czech literature we haven't had much international successes there are exceptions of course over the last year so we are a little bit sort of occupying <laughs> other countries but i think it's a very uh, very pleasant way to do this okay uh, Hik uh thank you Pavel. hikaru okay. you said that when you first read olga's work you thought immediately that she would really appeal to Japanese oh, yes. readers, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. has that and and what what is the reception? What has the reception in J in Japan been to her various books? You've done what? Four? Oh yes, yeah, 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 yes. Um, all three books are, uh, have been positively received in Japan, but of all has they has not uh, has gained the most popularity. And I I know understand why because when I was reading this this book, I felt kind of some kind of nostalgia in this book. I, uh, and I thought about this nostalgia, nostalgic feeling uh, uh, that I, I realized that what I felt is, uh, I, what I felt was a sort of oriental view of the world in existed in this book, uh, in, in Hasute Has Night. And in fact, I've, in fact, actually I've written uh, a paper on this subject and um, after the and interestingly, after the book House of the House Night was published, a very famous uh, critic commented that it reminds her of Kamono Chome. Kamono Chome was an assist, Japanese assist who lived uh, 800 years ago. Yeah, and uh, he wrote about the evanescence, uh, evanescence of life, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, that everything in this world changes. Uh, yeah, and as a, uh, uh, that is as a Buddhist view of word, and uh, one quote from his essays famously says that as water is not the same as water before, uh, like a uh, river flowing. Uh, so um, I think evanescence and instability uh, qualities uh, that characterizes Olga's working or Olga's work. So. Um, uh, there are among others reasons. There, there are reasons why Japanese readers love her uh, work, uh, work, um, uh, all that work. I think, and it's also said that uh, we very often experience uh, we we very often experience uh, natural disasters here in Japan. So we we don't believe anything everlasting. So it's also said that. So so. I feel simplified. I, I feel kind of simplified with all those words. Oh, uh, that's that's, yeah. fas that's fascinating, Hikaru. Thank you. Um, you know, another another question that comes up here. We have ten of Olga's translators in one place. This is very exciting. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, there are as many as ninety translators who have worked on her books. And another interesting element of translation publishing is that books are not necessarily published in the order in which they were published originally in the original language. And often a group of books are published only after one book makes a su great success. So you'll see many others coming out um, in a very short time, whereas there may have been a, a gap as a couple of you have mentioned. I'm curious to know about um, to what extent, when you do have all these options of worldwide versions of Olga's work, we're interested in knowing how, what do you, what kind of, do you consult with other translators in your, in your language or in others, or refer to other translations? And I think Lisa and Lotar, I think you could lead off this question because, of course, you're, um, 
you're the, the tandem pair in our conversation tonight. You're the, the collaborators who do work together. I think everyone would be interested in knowing um, what methods you use. Lisa and Lothar? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, we are here. Okay, we are here. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, yes, I, as Lothar said before, we uh, already translated another book before, um, Autobiography. It was also a very big book, 600 pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to um, um, not that one person translates the first half and the other one the second, but to change after every chapter. So we were exchanging the chapters all the time. And uh, this was a very good, uh, because I think otherwise, when one, some person translates a lot of uh, chapters and the other one the next, then you get lost in your own language style and you never see if it fits together. Maybe the reader later will see something doesn't fit, uh, that the language changes within the book. So we uh, decide to work like this again. And um, this was, uh, of course, it, it was a longer process than as if one person translates the whole book. I think uh, because we all, um, already uh, were correcting and um, um, uh, working on the style. On the other hand, if for me, uh, especially with the books of Jacob, it was um, a very necessary thing, very necessary experience, because uh, I think uh, I alone, there were so many things we had to read to understand this, uh, the topic and the life of uh, Jacob Frank and, and the theory and um, mystics behind it. And I think one person alone would not be able so good to, to understand everything, or at least I know that I wouldn't be able to, to, um, to see so many aspects I saw working together with Lothar. So it was, on the one hand, it was uh, from the language very uh, interesting and necessary because we found that in this process, we um, uh, very often we had the same thoughts. And when we were, uh, we met at least one time in the month that we were talking about the chapters we did in between. Uh, and then very often we came to the same conclusion. So uh, this was a very good and interesting process, but maybe it would not work with everyone. A lot of people told me they never could work together in translation with another translator. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But I, I must start, uh, um, I think this is, I can speak for both of us, uh, that we said uh, several times during this work on the books of Jacob that we really have the deepest, deepest, deepest respect for the persons who did this alone because uh, I, speaking for myself, uh, I think I would have been afraid to get lost alone. And you also said sometimes that uh, uh, it is so helpful because you you have doubts. We immediately could could discuss them. We could consult them, and we collected we collected a library. It's it's our private uh, Jacob Frank library. Uh, during the work, we we really read so many books, articles. Uh, we we also were in an archive in Offenbach, uh, where he spent his last years. There are lots of uh, Frankiana uh, there. We, we brought home really hundreds of pages of, of uh, xerocopies to, to study. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a huge work. Uh, these characters uh, appeared in our dreams, I can say. <laughs> we were really, uh, and we, are, we were absolutely absorbed. And so many times we said, now imagine you are working on this alone. This is uh, really, is uh, uh, almost incredible. Um, and the thing which was really uh, wonderful was that all the time when we were discussing uh, certain problems, discussing certain aspects of the translation, uh, it was a huge inspiration. And we actually, the question that came up sometimes uh, in discussions also with readers, uh, didn't you fight, didn't you quarrel? Uh, actually not, because there was nothing to, to quarrel and to find a solution uh, and uh, willing to, uh, to find the best solution. And this was always uh, the main priority. And sometimes we, we were twisting the sentence 25 times and then suddenly we said, this is it now. Mm -hmm. And the other person said, yes, you are right, this is it. So, ah. uh, but I also think it is, it is a question of, uh, uh, let's say, a question uh, just of 
work. I can understand that, for example, someone uh, says that uh, he or she would not like to to make such a tandem work. Uh, it just came out that uh, that we are somehow, uh, yeah, we are just somehow made for it. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I, I surely, I absolutely can understand it if if someone says uh, this would not be a uh, right thing for me. It's it's a question just of trying and finding out. I Thank you, and, and to Jennifer. Yes, yes, and you are one thing, very yeah. important thing. We want to uh, to send a special thank you and a special greeting to Danny uh, because she. We also had uh, contact with her, a quite intense contact, uh, and she uh, put us on a very important track because thanks to Jenny, we came to Salomon Maimonides. Thank ah. you, Jenny. Jenny, would you like to uh, respond to Lothar and, and Lisa's? comment uh, again wondering if how they could ever have done it without a partner um how have you, how are you how are you doing it alone yeah this is also yeah. my question yeah, yeah. but a, a short sorry a, 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 a little correction it was of course salomon maimon not maimonides maimonides was also in the book but uh, in another chapter it was salomon maimon thank you <laughs> yeah i was just gonna interject that i I'm so grateful to Lisa and Lothar and also to every every one of Olga's translators who is working on or who has worked on the books of Jacob because they are, Lothar and Lisa are right, it, it's not really something that you can do alone and as Ostap mentioned, Olga didn't do it alone either. I mean, she is using so many books and she also traveled so much and she went around Ukraine and she visited these spaces and this isn't just the work of one person's imagination so it can't be the work of one translator's imagination either and I and I was really lucky to <clears throat> to get Lothar and Lisa on the phone a few times we talked a lot about sources um, and we have a Facebook group for all of us now called Windows, which is um, comes from Olga's very short essay that appeared in English in the New Yorker about the pandemic. Um, and it really spoke to us as her translators because it seemed to correctly reflect this idea that one thing that Olga can offer the world is these kind of fresh perspectives um, and this borderlessness and this transparency that you don't often encounter in literature. So, um, so when I have questions, uh, Olga is always happy to help, but sometimes I feel like the best thing to do if there's a sentence that is really just giving me a hard time is to ask the other translators rather than asking Olga, because once you involve, I, this is just how I work, but once I involve the author, then I'm extending the translation into this whole other realm of biography and so forth um, and their intentions and maybe that doesn't isn't reflected in in the actual book in Polish and maybe it doesn't also need to be transmitted in the English version but just for reference this is the book that we're talking about um, it's quite enormous so this is one of the reasons why it's hard to translate alone but there are many there are many reasons so but I have not translated alone I've translated it with lots of help Oh, Barbara, you also did books of uh, books of Jacob into Italian. Did you did you consult with other translators along the way? I'm translating now in this moment. Uh, ah. I'm, yes, but uh, I'm I say always that I'm quite at the end. It means that uh, I have still 200 pages. Oh and my! I say okay, I'm quite at the end. <laughs> After 700 pages, you feel it is way at the end. Three quarters and, of the way. Sorry? It's three quarters of the way there. Yes. <laughs> and um, okay, uh, at the beginning of my career, I didn't think that uh, consulting with other colleagues uh, was so important. Uh, but now with Olga's book, uh, yes, it is. And in fact, uh, with the, also with this book, uh, with these um, books of Jacobs, uh, I'm working uh, not with a translator, but uh, with uh, an, uh, um, a Polish uh, actress of theater that uh, is, uh, she lives in Italy and uh, she is uh, um, uh, a friend of Olga. 
And so Olga suggested that uh, we work together because uh, she has uh, a very great culture and she, um, and, uh, she knows uh, very well the story of Jews in, in Poland uh, and also she knows very well uh, this story. And so she, she is very helpful for me. And um, um, at the beginning uh, with this book, uh, I thought that the most, most difficult thing was the story, the plot, and uh, all uh, the historical facts to understand. And uh, I told to her, with language, no problem. The language is very simple. I can understand quite everything. Uh, and then I discovered that uh, it is not in this way. I have uh, her, her, um, her help uh, is, uh, um, yes, I need it. And so we are working together. I translate, she corrects. Uh, we don't quarrel, but, um, and I think that uh, this is a way also to, um, uh, to change a little the idea that the translator works alone and uh, that uh, this uh, uh, image of loneliness of the translator is no more in this way, probably in the past, I don't know, but uh, now I think, uh, and also with this, uh, also in this moment, uh, as we can see that we are all here together yes. talking about, uh, uh, the same author, the same languages, and, uh, and uh, um, okay, so I hope, uh, I think that, that this uh, uh, collabor cooperation should be at the basis of the work process of a translator, of a, of a translation. Uh, th thank you, Barbara. Uh, Christina, have you, you've done so much translation, have, do you, have you found yourself consulting with other translators as you've worked on Olga's books? Uh, no, I didn't uh, consult with my fellow translators in the past, but um, I'm 10 pages into uh, books of, the books of Jacob, and I'm, I already, I'm feeling that it's a book like no other before, so uh, um, it will require a lot of research on my part, and I'm sure that I'll um, have lots of questions to ask my fellow translators, and um, I'll be happy to benefit from their insights and experiences. Well, why don't we take advantage of having all 10 of you here now and um, turn this over to you. What questions do you have for your fellow translators? Well, uh, I don't have a question related to the books of Jacob, but I have a question to Antonia. Um, are you the inspiration for the uh, short story, um, Professor Andrews in Warsaw? Absolutely not. I didn't know. No. Olga. I think when she wrote that, it was, it's not because inspired. you lost your luggage. And, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But and it, it was that period of martial arts. No, he's a person who arrives knowing no Polish whatsoever. And he arrives in Poland on the day that martial law is declared, December the 13th. Uh, 1981 and he's an Englishman who's been invited to come and take part in a conference in Warsaw and this poor man uh, arrives not understanding anything and so um, nobody comes to pick him up from the airport and he can't understand why and eventually some student comes and doesn't know quite what to do with him and they take him and they stick him in a flat and they just leave him there and there are tanks in the streets. And it's just before Christmas. And in Poland, people have carp for Christmas. And so you can go and buy a carp. And it's a famous thing that people buy them living. And they swim around in the bathtub before Christmas. And then you have to eat this pet fish you've got used to for Christmas. So he goes to a shop. And he can't really understand what's going on, except that someone keeps saying, live or dead, live or dead thinking he wants to buy one of these fish. <laughs> and it's, it's all about this bewildered professor. It's actually going to be filmed. Um, so um, really? it's got nothing to do with me. There is, um, my father inspired a story of August of which is in flights. Oh, okay. About a, about a professor in Greece who, who um, she, Olga was staying with me. And um, my father and his wife, my father was a professor of classical literature and they were traveling in Greece on a boat giving lectures. My father fell out of his bunk bed and made an almighty fuss about it, although the height he'd fallen was like this. So Olga thought this was funny and then based a story, wrote a story about a professor and his wife traveling in Greece and the professor actually dies in the story, leaving the wife to pick up the bits. So fortunately my own family story was not quite so dramatic. 
Well, I'm glad to hear that since it amuses you so, Antonia. <laughs> um, other, other questions, um, translators, for your colleagues here. Pavel, did you have a question uh, for, for the other translators? Yes, yes. So for uh, Pavel, sorry. Oh, okay, Barbara wanted to ask. Uh, I wanted to say, and that uh, says Antonia stuck in a, a flight in Warsaw, right? <laughs> so uh, I'll take it up to if you if you believe her story or not. Okay, actually, I I had a question for our Scandinavian colleague. Ah who is <clears throat> unfortunately you couldn't make it. Uh, to today's meeting, because I was really interested, and maybe some of you <laughs> could tell me, uh, uh, what's the reception of Olga's work in Scandinavia? You know, somebody knows, somebody knows, because I was interested in uh, in uh, in uh, in this aspect. Nobody. They gave yeah. her a small prize in Sweden. Yeah, I was gonna say about Sweden. She's yes. Yes, I remember. And apart from that, is it all? Maybe some of you know about Olga's relations to Scandinavia. This is just uh, my flick uh, that I that I got this morning. But maybe uh, maybe some other questions. But since since I have some 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 colleagues, I congratulate the tandem, Lothar and Lisa, uh, on on doing the book. And I was really interested in in, in the method that you did. Yeah. I co-translated uh, flights with uh, Petr Vidlak, as I said, and the method was totally different. We just did these little stories and stuff. Okay, what is my question? <laughs> they, they've talked about it uh, a little bit. Maybe I could change Scandinavia for Brazil? Ah, so yes. Olga, <laughs> Olga, tell us, because it's quite exotic for us, at least Europeans. Um, so you said <clears throat> that you've actually introduced Olga to Brazilian readers? No. Um, so there was nothing there was before? A, no, there was. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2013, okay. uh, flights mm -hmm. were published here in Brazil by the okay. Cinta Negra. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, Tomasz Barciński was the translator uh, that translated mm -hmm. flights, the first version of flights. Mm -hmm. um, so it was published, but um, I don't know why actually. Um, it it wasn't really. It it it, it didn't you know it, it didn't get very famous. Olga did not get very famous here in in Brazil. So mm -hmm. um, I think it was like more restricted to smaller to people who actually knew uh, Eastern European literature, and. Um, and there was no interest, uh, like even by the you know the publishers weren't really interested in in Olga's uh, work until until I could say last year. Um, okay. Yeah, the Booker Prize, of course, uh, made Olga famous here, and uh, the novel. And after the novel, mm -hmm. well, uh, she she became very very famous, and the reception has been very 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 good. Yeah, so people even uh, write. Uh, write me, you know, on Facebook or <laughs> just write me and, and ask me, you know, um, um, when when uh, Olga's books are going to be published, when more of uh, yeah. Olga's books uh, are going to be published, because uh, last yeah. year in November, uh, Drive the uh, Blow Over the Bones of the Dead was published in November, right after the Nobel Prize, so it ah. was you know, like a very, you know, right. uh, perfect timing, I would say. And mm -hmm. um, I translated flights once again, so that was also quite a difficult. Uh, yeah, it was it was hard because you know um, Tomasz Barczynski's trans translation was uh, from 2013, so there's not much. It's not like you know, not, not uh, uh, just a few years have passed from from 2013. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think that well. Um, the public is is quite interested, and I believe that Olga is going to be. Uh, it, it, she, she is already a success here, but she's going to be a bigger success. Yeah. Olga, I'm I'm interested that you said the Booker had um, such impact in yeah. in Brazil. Does the yeah. does the international Booker generally have have that much effect, or would you say it was um, particular to uh, or uh, that it was specific to Olga's case? 
No, in general, the booker has a very, very big impact. Uh, the thing is that the Brazilian market, like publishing market, is also is very, very big. So you have lots of, uh, you, have, you also have lots of uh, Brazilian authors. So uh, the you know foreign authors um, don't have that much space. You know, especially uh, Eastern European. Well, they're known like in very you know, limited circles. I would say academic circles as well. So to, to really get to the general public, it's it's not that easy. But um, I think that Olga managed to do it. <laughs> and she, I, I, I would say that she's a very universal, even though she's Eastern European, she's Polish and um, the Polish culture and the Polish mentality is very present in her, uh, in her works. But she is able to cross those borders and to really like with her, um, with the emotional side of, of the poetic side of her of her writing of her books, she is managed. She she manages to get to you know foreigners. Um, that's why I, I was curious as well. Uh, for example, what it was in how it was in Japan, if the Japanese people managed to like to understand Olga and um, if if they understand like the, the you know the cultural side as well of uh, of her of her writing of her books. Because right. I know that, for example, Chopin, uh, the Japanese people love Chopin. So, oh yes, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. What yeah. is it like with all those um, texts? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, as I said, uh, she gets very famous now, and she has gained the most popularity. And I, I, yes, um, yeah, and actually, actually, uh, this. Uh, uh, House of the Half Night was fourth reprinted, reprinted. Four times. Four, four times, yeah, four times. Wow. It's very rare case in foreign foreign literature, yeah, in, in today's market for literature. So, yeah, I'd say very popular and very famous writer now in Japan, even in Japan. So, yeah. Hikaru, are there... Um, what is the res what is the reception in Japan of Polish writers in general? Um, is Olga Tokarczuk really one of the few, or ha do you have you done a lot of other books? Or no, actually no, actually no. I translated one of short stories from Tadeusz Miczynski, very ah. <laughs> yeah, ancient poet, or or so. Uh, for example. Uh, 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 to last year, uh, this year, this year, uh, oh, oh, uh, to, oh, I, I, I forgot. Zofia uh, uh, Naukowska, uh, translation of Zofia Naukowska, uh, she's not a modern writer, uh, a person modern writer, but uh, uh, translation of Zofia Naukowska get uh, translation a literary translation prize in Japan this year. So uh, getting much more uh, popularity now, uh, Polish literature is getting much more popularity now. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, Jenny and Antonia, I had a question for you um, as our, our two English language representatives. Um, Obviously, the Nobel has different different impact for different writers. But um, Antonia, I think you mentioned that you saw a, a a rush of sales for your translation of House of Day, House of Night, um, after the Nobel. Uh, yes, the the it was out of print in Britain, but it was still um, on sale in the United States, where thanks to your good offices, it, it had appeared a long time earlier and not been given all that much attention. And the same with Primeval, which was published with a tiny little publishing house based in Prague, Twisted Spoon. And of course, the Nobel did suddenly sell those books again, um, which was very, very nice because you've done all that work and you feel all sad that nobody's taken any notice of it. And suddenly people wanted those older titles. In fact, there's there's some older books of Olga's that haven't been translated into English that I have tried and tried in the past and um, still hope I might perhaps be able to translate 
So yeah, it has definitely been a, a huge boost. And Jenny, were you over, I can't remember, were you already under contract for Book of Jacob when the Nobel came, when the Booker and the Nobel came through? I was, yeah, but the, but yeah, so I, um, I've mentioned this in other conversations about Olga's work, but I, it took a really long time to find a publisher for the book Flights in the US or in English. Um, and I think that the English speaking world's relationship to translation is a little bit different from the German speaking world, for instance, or or certainly neighboring countries uh, like Ukraine and the Czech Republic that translate more from Poland. Um, so it's really hard to sell a foreign author. Um, anything that, any particularities in her style were received by potential editors as like red flags, things that could potentially drive readers away from the book, which obviously turned out to be not the case at all, but it really did kind of take, the Booker Prize helped a lot in, the, in English too. And of course then the Nobel Prize helped enormously, but um, I, I was really lucky to find Jacques Testard at Fitzcarraldo, which is a very small public. I mean, it was basically just him at the time, um, a wonderful independent publishing house in London. And he signed both flights and the books of Jacob at the same time, um, which was a, a brilliant move on his part. And a wonderful show of confidence in an, in an author who, um, again, had not been um, so terribly, te or recently really tested in, in uh, published in English. But I think looking at this, it, um, I think most of the large number of our, of our uh, translators here have done flights. So um, it does appear to be the most popular of, of Ol Olga's books in, in translation. Um, those of you who have done flights, what do you think, um, what do you think is, is uh, the appeal? Oh, stop, what, what do you think is the appeal for flights um, to the Ukrainian reader? Well, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, uh, Olga Tokarczuk was popular in Ukraine, uh, even in, uh, in, in, uh, in late 90s. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, first translations of Olga's works appeared in some literary periodicals. So um, after um, 1999, uh, Olga is getting more and more popular. So it was really uh, some kind of a must read for us as uh, young people who uh, who were beginning to to study uh, foreign literatures, uh, but not only for, for specialists. It was, it was really popular, maybe uh, uh, partly due to uh, um, um, a very interesting situation with her, with Olga's uh, origin, because many people in Ukraine perceive Olga as Ukrainian writer or partly Ukrainian. Uh, after a Nobel Prize uh, for Olga, it was a huge misunderstanding in, in Ukrainian media, a journalist from different media uh, commenting uh, this prize or asking questions uh, to the translators about her work, um, uh, uh, were, were calling her Ukrainian writer. Uh, so and we were uh, we, we we were asking them please stop she's not Ukrainian yes she she has some uh, Ukrainian origin she has some Ukrainian roots but she's not Ukrainian uh, but uh, we uh, I, I always try to stress that this is uh, even more interesting situation that she is not Ukrainian but she feels uh, these uh, uh, Ukrainian Polish borderland. Uh, territories even better uh, and she knows them even better than many Ukrainian writers or Polish writers who are not that um, uh, uh, so how to say uh, border oriented. Uh, it's very important how she shows uh, the territories that we are used to perceive as Ukrainian uh, of course, taking into account uh, its complicated uh, history, but she shows it from the completely different point of view. Uh, 
uh, after Books of Jacob uh, were published in Ukrainian, uh, I, um, I saw the, uh, the, some reactions uh, concerning the images of Ukrainians in this novel, because there is only one hero, uh, very marginal one, uh, who is evidently Ukrainian, uh, despite the big part of the action uh, takes place in Ukraine. We have only evident Ukrainian here, only one. Uh, due to, we, we know it due to his name, Hritsko. Uh, this Ukrainian uh, guy uh, is, um, uh, he grew up in a Jewish family and he, he became, um, uh, in fact, he, he became a Jew. He, he, uh, he is not, uh, he does not bear Ukrainian identity. Uh, anymore in, uh, in this novel, and it was uh, um, uh, it was a circumstance uh, which was uh, discussed in Ukrainian uh, reading community. Why? Why does it happen? And but it's very it's the, the the answer is very simple. Uh, the point of view and this novel is a Jewish point of view. Moreover, as the point of view of small of a small very marginalized group of the Jews, marginalized even within the Jewish community. So it's quite, it's absolutely natural that uh, these, the, the, main, the group of the main heroes, these Jews, uh, Jacob Frank's sect, they uh, deal first of all with those whom they depend on. Uh, with uh, Polish aristocracy, with uh, uh, church um, uh, administration, uh, with the king, with the royal people from, from the royal court, etc. Uh, they do not uh, communicate much with the other marginalized groups like Ukrainians. Uh, this is some, maybe some bitter truth we have to accept. We have to understand uh, from our past. Uh, the real um, very objectively represented um, landscape, multicultural landscape, and we 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 see a, a, a real place of different national groups uh, and this territories. In okay, in then uh, it's 18th century, but still uh, many things, many uh, stories from that time are actual for us. That's fascinating, old stuff, um, Allison and. Esther, is it time to uh, turn the floor, op open the floor for questions from the audience? It is, it is. Thank you for such a masterful moderation, Susan. Oh. It's been wonderful to Thank you. listen to every, the, 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 the threads and the themes that flow in, among all of these translators. It's been, been wonderful. Um, so one of, uh, this question came in rather early. I think it was after the uh, self-introductions that we had. This is directed to Olga. Uh, she, the question is, you are the only translator on the panel, they noticed, who translates into a language that is not your native one. That is remarkable. How did your Brazilian Portuguese become native? How is your work received in Brazil, which we talked about? And um, you mentioned that there are other Brazilian translators. So, um, um. Yeah, well, I'm Polish. I was I was born in Poland. Um, I learned Portuguese. It's not my mother tongue, but I treat it as my mother tongue because, I, as I said before, uh, I I feel that I'm able to communicate better in uh, Brazilian Portuguese than in my own mother tongue in Polish. So um, I cannot explain it. It's just something that. Uh, it's it's unexplainable <laughs> to me. Um, and well, I've lived in Brazil. Um, my family, I mean, my closest family, my my husband uh, is is Brazilian, so um, I have daily contact with uh, with the language. And um, I also, I well, I think that I can, I when I write, I I express myself better. In, in Brazilian Portuguese than in, in, in Polish. Mm -hmm. So I, for example, I prefer to do translations from Polish to uh, Brazilian Portuguese than from uh, uh, Portuguese to, to Polish. Um, I just feel more comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, as to the reception, um, 
Well, I think it was, I think it was good. I mean, you would have to ask the readers. <laughs> Yeah, but no, um, I think you addressed that earlier. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the question that came from the, the viewer is one that has, we've addressed repeatedly in this conference, yeah. Translating the Future. We had a whole mini series called Motherless Tongues, Multiple Belongings, in which I think it's something that the translation community around the world, but especially in the United States is, is addressing who has the right or the authority to translate mm -hmm. into this language or that language. Um, I wanted to just point out, was it, there was a, a moment earlier when everyone was asking each other, did Barbara get to ask her, do you have a question for the other translators? I wanted to make sure that you... Um... Ah, yes, a question to whom we want to answer. Um, probably um, the novel has changed uh, Olga's life. And uh, probably, of course, I think. And uh, I'd like to know if uh, it has changed also the work uh, uh, the professional life uh, of uh, one of you in a certain way it is something extended from extended from before the novel after the work the novel in your work in your job who wants to answer it's a great question mm. nobody wants to <laughs> nobody wants to <laughs> yeah, we will we will <laughs> yes uh... Uh, thank you, thank you, Barbara, for this question. Uh, yes, indeed, it changed, uh, and uh, um, I can, I, I think, I can put that in a, in a very simple way. I, I hope this doesn't sound too simple. Um, it is, uh, it is just the continuation of the work is much easier. And um, in former times, especially when I started doing translations. I had uh, to knock on dozens, hundreds of doors. And now for the first time, really, the publisher was knocking and asking, do you want to? Okay. <laughs> this is, uh, it is, it is very simple, but it is also essential because this knocking on hundreds of doors is very exhausting uh, if you have to do it for a long time. So it has changed uh, the, the professional life uh, quite a lot, yes. Okay, it's the same experience I have in this moment. For this reason, I asked before, I spent a lot of time trying to convince an Italian publisher to publish not only Olga Kukacic's uh, novels, but also other uh, Polish authors. And uh, I had a lot of difficulties. Now are the publishers that are, that are calling me, please, can you translate the next year <laughs> or, or into two years or into three years? And so, yes. I, uh, it's good for us, don't you think? Yeah, of course, of course, it's good. And I mean, I mean, we all know that it's it can be a very hard job, and that um, it uh, it needs really a lot of time. I mean, uh, translating is not only translating; it yes. is we all know that translating is is living with the texts you translate. Translating means that you that you order books from all over the country, sometimes even from abroad, because you need some background information. You actually, for me, I can say that every book is like doing a, a little a little kind of studies. It's like a, a, a round, maybe, maybe not exactly a bachelor, but uh, <laughs> I would say that books of Jacob were more than a bachelor. <laughs> A PhD, uh, for, no doubt. A yeah, PhD. Or the master. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and for this reason, it is it is just it is just nice. It feels nice when you hear that knock then from the publisher side, and you do not have to knock by yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. We have one more question, uh, which I think is a fascinating one. That okay. Oh. Did you did you want to say something else? Like Ostap was had wanted Ostop, to respond yeah. to how oh, it is. Okay. Like, May I ask one question, one short question, vice versa to Barbara, mm -hmm. uh, concerning uh, books of Jacob and uh, her translation. Uh, when I was translating, uh, probably it's, uh, uh, it's uh, this question is more proper uh, to, uh, for Barbara than to Lorger and uh, Lisa, because uh, uh, they were translating this novel together. Uh, the different experience is when you translate this, uh, such a novel alone. Uh, when I was translating this book, I felt that I lost, I lost a connection with the outer world for some long period of my time and of my life. And 
and my friends uh, uh, said me that I, uh, I became very boring because uh, <laughs> after a couple of minutes of conversation, I, uh, I always be, I was beginning to, uh, to talking about uh, books of Jacobs and I, I was tell, I was retelling some stories from the book and was ex it was extremely boring. Uh, it was such a, uh, such a, a huge extent of absorption the, of, of uh, drowning into the text. Uh, Barbara, do you feel the same? Yes. <laughs> this is the question. Yes, and um, well, this job uh, on uh, the books of Jacobs uh, has um, determined uh, all of my all this uh, crazy year 2020 because I start in January and uh, I plan to finish uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the year. So I planned uh, each day how many pages uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, um, I didn't know very well the Jewish culture. So I have to study a lot, not only with books, but also with the serial on TV. And uh, thanks Netflix, <laughs> I, I and the poor husband I have, we watch a lot of serial on Netflix also about the Jewish culture, Jewish serial in Yiddish, because uh, I'd like also to hear how does it sound? And um, I spent a lot of time uh, in this studio on, on, on this book. Uh, and uh, I didn't lost uh, all the friends or my friends, but quite, uh, I think that uh, I have to work a lot in here to find them, to find them again and uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to try to live a normal life again, because this year is very particular, not only for Jacob, for books of Jacob, but in general. And uh, yes, yes, it's the same, uh, it's the same experience. And um, yes, well, thank you that you remember me, how I'm living in this period. Because <laughs> <laughs> I forget it. Okay. So the question that's come in, um, which is quite brilliant, uh, is uh, in Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, Olga has her protagonist, Janina Dusheko, and her friend Dizzy engage in the act of translating William Blake's poems. As translators, what was your impression of Olga's dramatization of the act of translation? She seems to be placing translation not only as a bridge between peoples and cultures, but also as a bridge between these lonely individuals. What was the experience of translating into your native tongue an act of English to Polish translation? Anybody? <laughs> I can say something about that because I had to translate in it from English into English. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. And I was a bit rebellious about this. I kind of threw all my toys out of my pram at the beginning and said, <laughs> I can't turn Blake into non-Blake. This is nonsense. And Olga was going, please try. And Jennifer completely gave me inspiration. We don't work together, Jennifer and I. We leave each other in peace. But she really helped me because she just quietly said in her subtle way, she just said, well, you know, I think I would do something with that. And that was, you know, red rag to a bull. So then I thought, well, how can I <laughs> recreate five different versions of a Quatrain by Blake, which is totally counterintuitive to me, to translate Blake into English <laughs> that isn't Blake. And I realized that the translations in Polish weren't actually terribly good. So all I had to do was do bad versions mm -hmm. and follow what was bad about the Polish. Um, but it felt very odd. And it's the thing people have asked me about the most about translating that book. So I'm curious to hear what other people say about doing that. Well, um, I can say <laughs> something because I did it in, uh, was it in Portuguese. Um, what, what was difficult was that uh, here in Brazil, there are almost no official translations of Blake. There was, there was just one, but it was very hard to get to it. So um, 
what I did was was look for these translations also on on the internet, like very amateur uh, translations, and I think I I inspired myself on that, <laughs> and just you know, <laughs> yeah. crowdsourced Blake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The question is, when you translate Blake from Polish, is it still Blake in the end? <laughs> so I had the same problem. I had to look uh, for the original. There was no translation into Romanian. I had to offer uh, the original and then the Polish base because otherwise I would have uh, gone further from, from the text. So I had to keep uh, the Polish translation though. But I there was a footnote explaining. So we're, we're actually starting to run, we are running down on time, um, but I'm going to ask in closing, one final question. I think most people who are, are watching this have some connection. They already are familiar with, with Olga Tokarczyk's work. But since she does have so many styles and modes for people who might be coming to her work for the first time, where would you suggest that they start? Which book would you tell them to start with or essay or story? I will put in a plug for Jenny Croft's translation of the night, which you'll find on the Words Without Borders site <laughs> um, at wordswithoutborders.org. That's the end of my commercial interlude. I was gonna say any of the short stories are, she's such a wonderful short story writer and I think that can get overlooked because um, Antonia and I are planning on putting together a collection of short stories um, at, to have a whole book, but that hasn't happened yet. So but you can easily just Google um, Olga Tokarczuk and Antonio Lloyd-Jones or Olga Tokarczuk and, and Jennifer Croft and you can find some, some really wonderful short stories published in magazines over the last 20 years. Um, and otherwise I think House of Day, House of Night would be where I would start translated by Antonia. We need to bring that back into print all of you publishers out there watching because it's <laughs> not available. And the copies that are available online are very pricey at this point. So uh, let's make it accessible. So uh, I think we are at the end of our time. Uh, this has been amazing. It's gone by in a heartbeat. I can't believe that it's been two hours. Um, we could go on for much longer. And um, also this entire conference has gone by in a heartbeat. We started in May. We began the planning two years ago and now we're at the end. Uh, so I wanna thank all of you uh, it, uh, that I'm seeing on my screen right now, as well as the grand total of 86 participants who gave their time and energy and beauty and love and knowledge to this conference and, um, and who helped Allison and I immensely <laughs> to get through a difficult time. Um, you have, you, Barbara, you had Books of Jacob, Allison and I had the conference. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I hope someday that we'll have a giant party somewhere wonderful where all 86 of you will gather in a single place and uh, we will celebrate uh, everything that all of you have done. Yes, yes. And we, we thank you, Allison and Esther for this brilliant programming. I am sure that many other people thought that Tuesdays were the highlights of their weeks. <laughs> thank you, thank you for saying that, Susan. Once again, and for the last time, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and to the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication, Boston University Center for the Humanities, the East Central European Center at Columbia University, and the Polish Cultural Institute New York for their support of today's event. And thank you to all the viewers out there who have extended the reach of translating the future much further than we ever imagined. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.